I think it is time to talk about the Holy Land. To whom does it belong? This video, I will answer this question from four different perspectives. The Holy Land belongs to whom according to Judaism? The Holy Land belongs to whom according to Christianity? The Holy Land belongs to whom according to Islam? And the Holy Land belongs to whom from a secular perspective? In today's day and age, if you want to hide the truth, you don't have to remove it from search results. All you need to do is to create 100 more alternatives to the same truth and show them next to each other. This way, a new researcher will never understand what's going on. He will just find endless opinions and alternative scenarios to the same matter. And he will end up saying, you know what, it's complicated and goes on with his life. In other words, they hide the truth in plain sight. And because everyone on the planet right now is researching the Holy Land, trying to find out who should it belong to, I decided to help you out with your struggle. This video will be a little bit long, but wait. The information that I will present in this video, it will literally take you a month to collect. We have to dig deep once and for all. I will go step by step, and in the end, I will leave the final decision to you. So bring your coffee, and let's start. We have to start with the Old Testament, because it has the most relevant information to our matter. Our goal will be to see if God really promised this holy land specifically to the children of Judah or not. I will start with Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Everyone agrees to this part, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. However, they sometimes divide on the interpretation of the third verse, I will bless those who bless you. According to Muslims, they will say it means you have to honor, respect, and ask for blessing for Prophet Abraham. How many times per day every Muslim on earth is required to bless Abraham? Exactly, minimum nine times per day, all his life. Once in dawn prayer and twice in every prayer after that. Blessing Abraham less than nine times per day is a major sin in Islam. And of course, more than nine is obviously recommended. The majority of Christians and Jews will say, we also bless Abraham. It doesn't have to be nine times per day. Even if it's once per year, it counts. And you know what? Okay. However, according to the remaining two groups, blessing Abraham means blindly financing and sending weapons to the descendants of Judah, whether they are on the correct path or breaking every human law on earth. It is not the time now to agree or disagree on the interpretation. We're just learning how people think. Remember, the verse literally says, I will bless those who bless you. You decide which interpretation is more accurate. Anyway, let's start with the juicy part. Genesis 12. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. It is real then. God decided that this land should be for the children of Abraham. Yes, that is correct. But wait until you see what happens next. Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abraham, look around from where you are, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Wait, what? I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth? But I thought the offspring of Abraham were some minorities scattered all over the world looking for a homeland. And the verse here is saying, if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Mm, there is something fishy here. Let's continue reading. Genesis 15. Look up to the sky. Count the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. Come on, God keeps repeating the same meaning, but using different analogies. They are countless like the dust of the earth, or like the stars in heaven. The description is exactly the opposite of the reality. Or maybe we need to recheck who are the children of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, who begot Jacob we got a lot of great men like Joseph, Moses, David, and so on. But Abraham also begot Ishmael, 
who was the father of the Arabs. Mm. Countless like the dust of the earth and like the stars in heaven. Maybe, who knows? It's too early to come up with any conclusions. Let's continue reading. Genesis 15. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. Okay, but who are the descendants of Abraham? Because technically, the people who have been living and ruling this land for the past 1,400 years are also the descendants of Abraham? You know what? I think I'm wrong. Maybe that's just my imagination. Let's continue reading until we understand. Genesis 16. The angel of the Lord found Hajar near a spring in the desert. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Too numerous to count? Isn't that the same description that was said to Abraham about his offspring? It is now being said about Ishmael, the son of Hajar, the father of the Arabs. Nah, I'm wrong. I don't think the author will let it end this way. There should be a twist. Let's continue reading. Genesis 17. Then God said, Yes, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Yes, here is the twist. See, the covenant is with Isaac, not Ishmael. But what about Ishmael? What will happen to him? Genesis 17. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and I will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. Okay, that settles it without any doubt. Both are the children of Abraham. Both will be great. However, Ishmael's side will be numerous and leaders, but they don't have a covenant. However, Isaac's side will have the covenant. Let's continue. Genesis 18. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. All the nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about Abraham what he has promised him. Okay, it's getting clear now. We already established that the covenant will be on the side of Isaac only. The deal is as follows. The children of Isaac are required to do what is right and just. If they do so, then the Lord will fulfill the promise he made to Abraham. In other words, they become righteous in exchange for the promised land. And that settles it. The land was actually promised by God himself to the children of Isaac. It is real. And not to the children of Ishmael. But remember that it is conditional on them honoring their part of the deal too and being righteous to deserve it. We can find the same meaning in Exodus 19. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. See this if condition in the verse, if you obey me and keep my covenant? Again, in other words, righteousness in exchange for the promised land. And also you can find the same meaning in Leviticus 26. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain. I will grant peace in the land. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers. And I will keep my covenant with you. Focus specially on verse 9. If you obey my commands, I will keep my covenant with you. So righteousness in exchange for the promised land. Let's continue reading because the next part is the most important part. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all of these commands, uh, now we will understand what will happen if they don't honor their part of the deal. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands, and so violate my covenant. Then, I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases, and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. I will set my face against you, so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. I will break down your stubborn pride. I myself will be hostile towards you and will afflict you with your sins. 
I will bring the sword on you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. You will be given into enemy hands. I will scatter you among all nations. I will draw out my sword to pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. As for those of you who are left, I will make their hearts so fearful in the lands of their enemies. You will perish among the nations. The land of your enemies will devour you. Wow, that's tough. Let's summarize. If you are righteous, you get the promised land plus other perks, like you get provision, you get rain and stuff. But if you don't obey the commands of God, no promised land for you, no rain, and you will basically get destroyed and humiliated by your enemies, and you will be scattered all over the world. You know what? It's a fair deal. I would take the deal, and I will follow the commands of God blindly without any exception. The real question is, did they? Did they really follow the commands of God, or they didn't? Let's see. 1 Kings 6 God said to David, The word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for this temple you are building, if you follow my decrees, observe my laws, and keep all my commandments and obey them, I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David your father. There is another big if here. 1 Kings 11 But Solomon was obsessed with their love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 wives who were concubines. In his old age, his wives tempted him to follow other gods. He was no longer committed to the Lord his God as his father David had been. So Solomon did what the Lord considers evil. Solomon built an illegal worship site on the hill east of Jerusalem for idols. The Lord told Solomon, because this is your attitude and you have no respect for my promises or my laws that I commanded you to keep, I will certainly tear the kingdom away from you. Hmm, seems like it's starting to go south for them. Isaiah 1 Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a broad of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. That's bad news, I think. Isaiah 3 The Lord says, The women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Therefore, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bold. Yikes, bold. Isaiah 30 Woe to the obstinate children, to those who carry out plans that are not mine. For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, See no more visions, and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, prophesy illusion. Leave this way, get off this path, and stop confronting us with the Holy One. Wow. Stop telling us about God and His straight path. We don't want to listen anymore. Tell us nicer things instead. Tell us about anything other than God. Seems to me like breaking the covenant. Isn't it obvious? Wasn't the deal righteousness in exchange for the promised land? Deuteronomy 29 And the answer will be, it is because these people abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them into another land as it is now. That is so explicit. God is clearly saying, no more promised land for you, no more covenant for you. You already broke your end of the covenant. And let's read this final one, because this is the most interesting of all of them. Please focus, especially on this one. Genesis 49, 10. The scripture will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. This was a prophecy by Jacob himself to his sons. Let's read it very carefully. The scripture means the leadership and the obedience of the nations. This scripture will stay inside Judah, but not forever. It will stay inside Judah until he comes. Let's please define the word until 
So no one will write me in the comments, no, that's your own interpretation. So according to the Cambridge Dictionary, until means continuing to happen before a particular time or event and then stopping. See the stopping part? Now let's read it again. The leadership of the nations will be inside Judah until he comes. At this moment in time, the leadership of the nations will stop being inside Judah and the leadership of the nations will belong to someone outside Judah. Don't ask me who he is because we will have to go off subject. For now, I can just tell you that he is not from Judah. So, he is not Solomon, he is not David, and he is not Jesus. All the names you can think of are from inside Judah. But God will give the leadership of the nations to a man who is not from Judah. No further commentary is required. Now, let's talk about the covenant from the perspective of the New Testament. What does the New Testament think about the chosen people? Are they still chosen or did they lose their status when they broke the covenant and went against God? Matthew 23 You testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets. So the question is to you. Are these the chosen people or the killers of the prophets? And do they still have a covenant with God? According to the Talmud, please check this reference. Yeshua of Nazarene, i.e. Jesus of Nazareth, who sought to harm them is now being tortured, boiling in excrement. That is boiling in a big pile of hot number two. Are they the chosen people or the killers of the prophets? And do they still have a covenant with God? And also according to the book of Acts, number 13, God already fulfilled the covenant by raising Jesus. We tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors. He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. The covenant is done. No more promised land. Also in John 18, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. According to this verse, the kingdom of Jesus is not in the Holy Land anymore. The kingdom of Jesus is in heaven. Or at least, this is according to the Catholics and the Orthodox Christians. Protestants may disagree. They claim that Jesus will have two kingdoms, one on earth and one in heaven. But this is unrelated to whatever we're discussing now in this video, as Jesus didn't come yet to make a kingdom on earth. So whether it is in heaven or it will be on earth, Still, there is no promised land for the people who killed the prophets and disbelieved in Jesus himself. We saw what happened with the revelation of Maria. 2,000 years of suffering came to the world. Christian Inquisition, Spain, Portugal, all the from a dream of a pastor That's who cheated on her husband. That's it. From that, 2 billion people today follow this idol named JC. You can even see Jesus in the New Testament telling them the exact same message in Matthew 21. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruits. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him. We might disagree on who are those people who will take the kingdom of God from them and produce its fruits. But in the end, it doesn't matter who are these people. What it matters is, Jesus told them, it will be taken away from you and given to other people. Nothing is for them anymore. After you read all this, you stare in confusion and amazement at some of the Protestants, who they somehow convinced that Jesus wants them to support the unchosen people. After all of this clear, explicit verses, quoting Jesus himself, saying the exact opposite, somehow they convinced millions of Protestants that if you support us, the unchosen people, blindly, financially, and militarily, and look away when we commit war crimes, Jesus will be happy with you, and he will come to earth, and he will take you to heaven before the Armageddon. I don't know how they did this mass brainwash, subhanallah, but the good news is the overwhelming majority of Christians still 
stick to the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. And they don't believe in this newly fabricated ideas that goes against their own holy book. That is the godly thing to do. We respect one another. The godly thing to do is to kill you. The godly thing is to kill me. That's right. That's what the Torah says. The Torah says to kill us. The Torah says that uh, people who worship idols such as yourself, when there is a Sanhedrin... To kill us. Yes. Okay. That's what the Torah says. So we know how the Jewish people feel about Christians, yes? That you discriminate against Christians. Christians are idol worshippers. You discriminate against Christians. The Torah says that Christianity is idol worship. Before I continue, before I start with the perspective of the Quran, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, I am trying super hard to avoid specific names and keywords that will trigger the algorithm. Because the algorithm lately is throwing warnings, strikes, bans at everyone as fast as a machine gun. And I know that after all of this effort, somehow this video's reach will also be restricted anyway. The only way for this valuable information to reach whoever needs it is through you. Help it spread, first by a like and comment, then by sharing it on your social media accounts. Thank you for your help. Now let's start with the Holy Quran. The question is, according to the Holy Quran, did God promise the Holy Land to a specific group of people or not? And you know what? The story in the Holy Quran is not completely different from the story of the Old Testament. Yes, there was a covenant. Yes, there was a promised land. The only difference is God in the Quran is not racist. God does not side with a specific family or a specific race just because of their DNA. God promises rewards for whoever is righteous, for whoever obeys his commands from any race, from any family, from any color, from any ethnicity. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in tansuru Allah yansurukum wa yuthabbit aqadamakum. Believers, if you obey God, he will support you. Wa in tatawallaw yastabdil qawman ghayrakum thumma la yakunu amthalakum. And if you don't, he will replace you with other people and those people will be better than you. That's it. After you learn the teachings of Islam, you can't make a claim like this. You can't say, you know what? God promised me something. Whether I obey him or not, I still will claim my reward. Even if I go against God and kill his prophets. Read with me. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَا يَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah promised those of you who believe and do good that he will certainly make them successors in the land as he did with those before them. It is an open promise until the end of time. If you be righteous, he will grant you victory. That promise is literally for everyone, not for a specific race. Let's read again the whole story of the Old Testament, but this time we read it from the Quran, from the perspective of the Muslims. First, Abraham is called in the Arabic tongue, Ibrahim. So I will be referring to him as Ibrahim from now on. We reveal to you, O Prophet Muhammad, you should follow the faith of Prophet Ibrahim exactly. Prophet Ibrahim was neither a Christian nor a Jew. He was a Muslim. What does that mean? It means he was someone who submitted his will to God without belonging to any specific cult like the cults that we call Christianity or Judaism. By the way, this is not the time to agree or disagree. You're just learning the perspective of the Muslims. Prophet Ibrahim was before the birth of Judah, so he's not a Jew. He was before the birth of Moses himself, so he didn't follow the Torah. He was before the writings of Paul, so he didn't understand the concept of resurrection and uh, dying for your sins and crosses. He didn't, he didn't witness all that. He's not a part of all that. So he was just a man who submitted his will to God, i.e. a Muslim. Honoring the Sabbath was ordained only for those who dispute about Ibrahim. Now let's talk about the chosen people. Remember all the favors I granted you, 
and how I honored you above all others. God honored them by saving them from Pharaoh, providing them with shades, food from the heavens, and sending them many, many prophets. Each prophet was a second chance for them to uphold the covenant. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَكُمْ لَا تَسْفِكُونَ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَلَا تُخْرِجُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ ثُمَّ أَقْرَرْتُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَشْهَدُونَ And remember that we took your covenant, that you would neither shed each other's blood nor expel each other from their homes. You give your pledge and bore witness. ثُمَّ أَنْتُمْ هَؤُلَاءِ تَقْتُلُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَتُخْرِجُونَ فَرِيقًا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ But here you are, killing each other and expelling some of your people from their homes, aiding one another in sin and aggression. أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you believe in some of the scripture and reject the rest? Because that is exactly what they're doing. They are believing in part of the scripture, which is, I will give you land, I will give you rain, I will give you provision. But they are rejecting the other part of the scripture, which is saying, but if you don't follow the covenant, I will punish you, I will destroy you. They choose only part of the scripture which they like, and ignore the rest of it. فَمَا جَزَاءُ مَنْ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Is there any reward for those who do so among you other than disgrace in this worldly life? وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ أَشَدِّ الْعَذَابِ And being subjugated to the harshest punishment on the day of judgment. أَفَكُلَّمَا جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ بِمَا لَا تَهْوَىٰ أَنفُسَكُمْ مُسْتَكْبَرْتُمْ فَفَرِيقًا كَذَّبْتُمْ وَفَرِيقًا تَقُتُلُونَ Why is it that every time a messenger comes to you with something against your desires, you become so arrogant, rejecting some messengers and killing the others? When the new revelation, i.e. the Quran, came to them, they disbelieved in it. The curse of God be on the disbelievers. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قالوا نؤمن بما أنزل علينا ويكفرون بما ورائه When it is said to them, believe in what God has revealed They reply, we only believe in what was sent down to us, only us And they deny what comes afterwards قل فلما تقتلون أنبياء الله من قبل إن كنتم مؤمنين Ask them, O Prophet, then why did you kill God's prophets before? If you are truly believers قل إن كانت لكم الدار الآخرة عند الله خالصة من دون الناس فتمنوا الموت فتمنوا الموت إن كنتم صادقين Say O Prophet, if the eternal home of the hereafter is exclusively for you out of all humanity then wish for death if what you say is true ولا يتمنوه أبدا بما قدمت أيديهم والله عليم بالظالمين But they will never wish for that because of what their hands have done And Allah has perfect knowledge of the wrong doers. وَلِتَجِدَنَّهُمْ أَحْرَصَ النَّاسِ عَلَىٰ حَيَاهِ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا You will surely find them clinging to life more eagerly than any other people, even more than the polytheists themselves. يَوَدُّ أَحَدُهُمْ لَوْ يُعَمَّرُ أَلْفَ سَنَةِ وَمَا هُوَ بِمُزَحْزِحِهِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ أَيْ يُعَمَّرُ Each one of them wishes to live a thousand years, but even if they were to live that long, it would not save them from the punishment. Let's summarize. God chose a group of people and made a deal with them. If you follow my commands, I will raise your honor in the land, I will support you. And then they broke the deal, went against the commands, killed the prophets, and disbelieved in the revelations, and that made them cursed. So they started as the chosen people, then became the cursed people. You can find the same meaning in Surah An-Nisa, verse 154. We raised the mount over them as a warning for breaking their covenant and said, Enter the gates of Jerusalem with humility. We also warned them, Do not break the Sabbath, and took from them a firm covenant. Then they were condemned for breaking the covenant, rejecting God's signs, and killing the prophets unjustly. They were cursed for their denial and outrageous accusation against Mary. And for boasting, We killed the Messiah, we killed the Messiah. Jesus, the son of Mary. Let's summarize again. They started as the chosen people, then they went against God, then got another chance with another prophet, and then killed the prophet, and another chance with another prophet, and then disbelieved in the prophet, and then another chance a lot of times, until finally accused Virgin Mary in her honor and tried or decided to kill Jesus. And that was it.
no more second chances. And then the covenant is done, and then we have a new prophet from outside of Judah, which they are still welcome to follow and have their honor and have their covenant by following him. God's promises are conditional on being righteous. God does not promise the land for a race, regardless of what they do. God does not promise the land for people who boast about the fact that 25% of the population of their capital city are colorful. Google it if you don't believe it. It is in their own tourism website. 25% of the inhabitants of their capital city. فَبِمَا نَقْدِهِمْ مِيثَاقَهُمْ لَعَنَّاهُمْ وَجَعَلْنَا قُلُوبَهُمْ قَاسِيَةً For breaking their covenant, we cursed them and hardened their hearts. They distorted the words of the scripture and neglected a portion of what they have been commanded to uphold. قال موسى لقومه استعينوا بالله واصبروا إن الأرض لله يورثها من يشاء من عباده والعاقبة للمتقين. Moses reassured his people, seek the help of Allah and be patient. Indeed, the land belongs to Allah alone. He grants it to whoever he chooses from his servants. But the ultimate outcome only belongs to the righteous. وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الزِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ It was decreed in the book of David that the land is for the righteous people. And finally, this is the most important one as it is closely related to the current events. Surah Al-Isra verses from 4 to 7. God decreed on the children of Jacob, let's say Jacob, that they will corrupt in the land twice. The first time, people with great power and might ravaged your homes and destroyed you. That already happened. You can read about the Persian enslavement. But then, you get a second time, where you will become so powerful. You will have a lot of money and control, and you will corrupt the land again. Listen to this part. There was a group of people who entered the Holy Mosque. Those people will come back. They will enter the Holy Mosque again like they entered it the first time. And they will disgrace you and utterly destroy what you have built with arrogance. I recommend you go read these verses yourself, Surah Al-Isra, from 4 to 7. And you guess what are these verses referring to. Finally, for this video to be a complete reference, we have to address the same question, but from a secular perspective. The Holy Land belongs to who? But in this part of the video, we're addressing people who do not believe in the idea that God assigned a piece of land to a group of people. Therefore, we will be discussing the matter purely using human logic. And we will immediately ask, why do you think this piece of land specifically belongs to you? And these are the five most common answers you will find on the internet. Because we were being persecuted in a lot of places around the world, therefore we deserve to have our homeland. We deserve to take this land by force from its indigenous people. You know what? I will not disagree. If you really think that is fair, then let's apply it to everyone. The Ukrainians are being persecuted by Russia, right? Then they have the right to remove the inhabitants of Berlin, Germany by force and create their new home there. How about that? The minority of Muslims in India are being persecuted by the Hindu extremists. Therefore, they have the right to remove the inhabitants of London by force and make a new home there. How about the minority of Muslims in the West Bank who are being persecuted right now? They have the right to remove the inhabitants of New York City by force and make a new home there. If this is fair according to you, why not apply it to everyone? Why only yourself? Then we have common answer number two. Because 2000 years ago, my grand, 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 grandfather lived there and he created a strong kingdom that lasted 80 years. In other responses, the number of years will be much larger because they are referring to the number of years they lived, not ruled. But anyway, you get the point. I will not judge the logic itself. Let's assume that the logic is fair and correct. If we assume ownership, 
and the right of return to everyone who has a grand 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 grandfather who lived in this specific piece of land 2000 years ago okay then that doesn't only apply to you because there are other people who lived there before your grandfather and other people who lived there after your grandfather and they can make the same claim but you only give the right of return to yourself only that is unfair according to your own logic those other people also have the right to return what about the people who lived in this land before your grand grand grandfather invaded it 2000 years ago the same historical document by the way that you are using to prove that your grandfather lived there which is genesis 12 verse 6 especially also states that there were other people living there before you and they are called the canaanites and these people still exist today why don't they have the right to return to why only you what about the people who lived there for the last 1400 years after you have left it do they also have the right to return according to your logic the problem is these rules are only applied selectively because one side has the power and money to buy the whole justin biebers of the world and the justin trudeaus of the world while the other side doesn't have enough money to do so one side has the power even to force me to delete half of the script of that video before i record it because i know that the deleted part will trigger the algorithm to ban my whole account but the other side they don't have this power there is another problem with this logic when you are looking for a home you are choosing between central africa argentina east ussr and the middle east some of you actually went to the east ussr it is still on the map till today check it out if it was really from the beginning about returning to the land of your grandfathers why were central africa argentina and the east ussr viable options on the table why were they even part of the discussion there is another problem with your logic if we apply this logic as a general rule for all humanity shouldn't the americans go back to europe where they belong 2000 years ago Shouldn't the Andalusians go back to Spain? Shouldn't the Turks go back to Central Asia? Shouldn't the African Americans go back to Africa? If we apply this logic to Canada, Canada will have three people living there now. If we apply this logic to Australia, it will have two people living there. If this is your logic, why can't you apply it to everyone? And the final problem with the same logic is we are somehow supposed to believe that these white people with blue eyes are the descendants of the black slaves who fled with Moses from the Pharaoh of Egypt? And if so, let's assume that Moses and the slaves were white people with blue eyes. What about the Ethiopians who claim to belong to the same family you belong to? If you are so confident, why do you make the DNA tests illegal between your people? Common answer number three. The land was empty when we arrived. This is a claim that you will not find a lot of details about, especially on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, for obvious reasons. However, there are other sources outside of these websites, on other social media that give more freedom of speech. All I can say here right now, without getting banned, is whoever remained from the indigenous people still have their home keys tied to their necks until today. They also still have their land ownership documents but they can't go back to their homes anymore. We still until now have bus tickets and train tickets to the major train station that was in the quote unquote empty land without people. Imagine this empty land without people having a bus station and a train station. And the last thing is part of the land is a holy site for 2 billion Muslims who were visiting the same site the same way they are visiting Mecca today. The same also applies to Christians' holy sites there. All of that was in a barren land without people. Common answer number four. At least we have democracy. We are the only democracy in this area. This funny claim doesn't need much explanation. This claim is made by every government on earth, even though most of them are the exact opposite. This claim is made by governments who had the same leadership since 1996. In this specific issue, you must listen to the people, not the government. This is the only way you can see with your eyes the exact opposite.
And finally, if you're thinking, why don't both sides just live peacefully together in the same community as neighbors who love each other? I will just tell you, that was the case from the 7th century all the way to the beginning of the 20th century. Both sides testify to that. They lived peacefully side by side. The freedom to live was for everyone until they decided that the freedom should be exclusive only to one side, excluding the other. This is how the problem started. If you go back in time, there never was a problem. The new inhabitants of the land don't want that solution. Do you know why? Because the indigenous people have a very, very high birth rate. And if the land is under democracy and equal rights to everyone, high birth rate can easily shift the whole political view of the leadership. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Unfortunately, I can't say more than that. Jews have a golden history in the Muslim countries. For centuries, we live in Muslim countries. Sorry, uh, try not to hate. Much better than in the other countries. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, we burned the Jews. Even today, after 75 years of killing, 75 years of occupation, go in any Muslim country, they are welcoming Jews. They went to these Arab and Muslim lands to escape persecution uh, from the Crusades, from the Inquisition, and from many other trials and tribulations, and, the, um, and even World War II. Uh, the Arab and Muslim lands opened their hearts, opened their lands, and uh, provided a safe haven and a gracious hospitality for the Jewish people. Clearly, they, we, we have different religion, and yet uh, we, were, we were accepted in these Muslim and Arab lands. We believe in one God, and we were accepted. We have different ways of serving God, but yet, as I, they, they, we were respected, and the, the, even the Muslim religion requires of that, uh, of, of the, uh, the Muslim people to, to, to provide protection and hospitality, and they did uh, carry that out. That's clear. Nobody could refute this. Common answer number five. It doesn't matter who has the right to the land. We won it in a war, and this is how nations are created. If you win a land in a war, it becomes yours forever. Okay, this is the rule of the jungle, right? If you believe in it, if you really believe in the rule of the jungle, why wouldn't you apply the same rule to the land conquered by Russia, for example? Or do you apply the rule selectively, only for a group of people, not for the others? And the second question is, if you accept it upon yourselves to believe in this rule, do you accept a group of people who are calling for the removal of your claimed state? Or do you label them as anti-something? Either you believe in the rule of the jungle or not. Choose one of them. There are some more answers that you might find on the internet, but they are so ridiculous we don't have to waste our time discussing them. I hope this video opened your eyes to a lot of things that are happening around you right now. If you want more insights, I really recommend you check this video. Racism started from the Bible. It will light up a lot of dark spots for you. Thanks and salam alaykum. والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساء مستقرا ومقاما والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قاما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون ولا يقتلون نفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون 
ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما ومن تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متابا والذين لا يشهدون الزور والذين لا يشهدون الزور وإذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما والذين إذا ذكروا بآيات ربهم لم يخروا عليها صما وعميانا والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقون فيها تحية وسلاما خالدين فيها حسنت مستقرا ومقاما